welcome back students so we uh, start on the topic of plastic deformation today and we have already completed the elastic deformation the elastic properties of the material now in between the elastic and plastic the transition that takes place from elastic to plastic this transformation or transition can be best described by one of the mechanical characteristics of the material which is the tensile behavior so we will start with tensile test of a material usually how does the tensile test uh, the tensile characteristic of a material look like the tensile response i should say so it would look something like this so you will have a y axis and a s axis x axis on the y axis you have usually stress and on the x axis you have strain and the plot is usually given something like this so somewhere the material the material will break and uh, what you will have at point a you will have a sample which will look something like this at point b over here you would see that the sample has extended and we will talk more about it but what you will notice is that extension is throughout and the drawing is not very clear let me redraw this part it should remain valid at somewhere at this point c what you would see is something like this happening now this particular region has unevenness or this region has become thinner than the rest of the region this is called necking we will talk a lot about it later on but for now that this is called neck and what it means is that now the stress would remain concentrated in this region why because now this is the smallest cross section so the load will be here so the stress will be highest would be here and therefore this is what will deform or fail first so the more, most of the not most all the deformation at beyond this point will take place in this neck region okay so if you want to read more about this particular tensile characteristics you can read more about it from chapter 3 by hosford mechanical behavior of material by hosford and uh, you would see that usually there are two different uh, in metals we have two different types of uh, deformation or the stress tensile test characteristics that you obtain usually one would be like this which will be very smooth so something like aluminum or copper or brass uh, these kind of alloys would give you the smooth curve that you see on the left on the other hand medium carbon steel you would see a stress strain curve which looks more like this so there is a point up to which stress increases and then it suddenly drops and then it fluctuates and after uh, this particular point then it again starts to increase and then later on uh, rest of the part is similar so it will go to a maxima then come down and then at some point it fails so this is a probably the point where it failed while for this one this is the point where it failed now there are so much information that is uh, compressed in this one plot that you would be amazed so this is what we will 
look at. But before that, let's uh, understand a few of the things. Now, when we are talking about tensile test, so for one thing that I want to ask you is, do you think that any kind of sample can be tested and then you can compare? So for example, let's say one of your friend tests a sample which, whose shape is like this, the one that you are shown in blue. So you would imagine that it, when it gets extended, it will look like the sample in orange. On the other hand, one of your other friend tests a sample which tests like this, uh, sorry, which looks like this. So very orthogonal in shape. On the other hand, still another friend tests a sample which, is, which has trapezoidal heads. Okay. On the other hand, you have tested a sample which looks like this. So the question is, would you get the same stress strain behavior for all of these? Next is next question is so one is the questions are can we take any shape? Second question is can we take any size? Meaning no matter what is the length, we can take whatever length we want. So we know that this is called the gauge length for all these samples. So can we take any size? Next is, can we do it at any temperature? And when you do, when you take any shape, any size and perform the tense at any temperature, are we still going to see the same stress strain curve no matter where you are conducting, whether you are in US or India or Europe? And the answer is no, we cannot take any shape, we cannot take any size, we cannot do it at any temperature. And there is a standard which has been defined. So for example, for the tensile test, there is a standard which is given by one of the standard making agencies, which is American Standard for Testing of Materials. And the short form is ASTM. And one of the standards that they have defined for metallic for tensile testing of metallic materials is E8 slash E8M. Okay. Why do we need to define that there has to be a certain shape, certain size, or range of size and range of temperature? The answer is that if you look at these, you can clearly see that these regions will have stress concentration, okay? And if you have stress concentration, even in fact, even in this one, you would have stress concentration. And therefore these kind of shapes would fail very quickly. On the other hand, this is your gauge length over here and the gauge length is gradually increasing and therefore there is no stress concentration. So the overall stress remains concentrated here and it does not, uh, it remains confined in this gauge length but and does not get concentrated at any point and therefore it will not show any premature failure and therefore whatever values you would get would be the true value for the material and in fact you would probably if you do or test for all these different shapes you would see that you will get the highest stresses yield stresses or uts for this particular shape now what about size you would one may ask okay shape may be a problem but what about size we can take a very long size very small size why does this mat does it matter because in the end we are talking about stress and not force so stress would be force per, per unit area and that is true but then there is also something called as size effect so very small samples show a very different uh, stress strain behavior than a very large sample. 
and this is called size effect and there are host of reasons we don't want to get into that right now but there there exists what is called as size effect and hence if you want to compare apple to apple and oranges to oranges we need to have same range of uh, sizes of the sample and this is what again this particular standard e8 e8m defines in fact uh, this is only for room temperature there is e21 which defines for the tensile testing at higher temperature then again for specific materials for example cast materials there is a different type of uh, testing defined so these are just definition of particular test so that proper comparison can be made and for that standards have been developed and this is uh, this is one of those standards that i have listed over here okay so that tells us uh, about what are the different uh, uh, constraints for the sample now let's come back and look at the stress strain curve here so you must have seen this kind of stress strain curve even at your uh, high school level and you may have been told that there is a point which is called yield point so you would have been said told or informed that this is somewhere the yield point lies and this uh, would be the point where elastic behavior ends and plastic behavior starts but then how do we find that elastic what uh, how do we find that yield point and what you would have been defined what you would have been told is that you find a offset 0.2% strain offset and that point would give you the yield point well for high school level that is knowledge is good but there is limitation in that actually there are three points which are very close to each other what are these three points they are proportional limit elastic limit and yield stress what is proportional limit we know the relation sigma is equal to e times e is the elastic modulus times epsilon where epsilon is the true strain and sigma is the true stress so this is a linear relation and what is the origin we remember from our first few lectures that if you look at the f versus r curve then this is how it looks like and in fact it is this slope if you remember from there it is this slope del f by del r at r not which defines the value e so this uh, region up to which this remains linear this is what is called the proportional limit you as you would keep increasing the distance separation between the two atoms or basically you are applying stresses so that the extension becomes longer and longer then at some point this no longer remains a linear relation and it becomes non linear but still it retains its elastic behavior meaning even if you come to probably some somewhere over this point so this is not really following this e uh, slope is not e over here but if you were to reduce the force or uh, or take away the force then the material will come back meaning it has not yet transitioned into the plastic behavior and it retains its elastic behavior the only thing that is not happening here compared to earlier point which was somewhere over here is that this particular point does not follow the linear relation between sigma and epsilon so the point up to which this stress and strain uh, or let me be more precise up the point up to which it remains elastic and although it may not remain 
linear, it may not follow the linear relation, that point is called the elastic limit. So proportional limit where you have linear relation up to the point where up to which you follow linear, linear relation between stress and strain. Elastic limit, the point up to which actually the elastic properties or the elasticity is retained. If you go beyond this point, then the local stresses become so high that dislocation starts getting generated. We'll talk more about dislocations later on, which is the core of plastic deformation. So up to this point, it is this point at way up to which that dislocations are not generated. Now yield stress. So ideally elastic limit is the point where the yielding begins. And therefore that should be yield stress. But then when you are doing the measurement uh, physically, you cannot differentiate, you cannot go inside the material and say, okay, now the dislocations are getting generated. And therefore we have a way of defining or obtaining elastic stress. And it has been defined as the point where you have 0.2% strain. So this is called offset method. We'll come back to it later on. But for now, the point we are trying to make here is that there are basically three points, proportional limit, elastic limit, and yield stress. And if you were to look at the stress strain curve, basically you will have, so the elastic limit, so in this one, it probably looks like the elastic limit, the, sorry, the proportional limit, is somewhere over here. And probably the elastic limit would be up to somewhere over here. And if you could draw a line for 0.2% strain, so this is probably your yield stress at 0.2% strain. Okay, so clearly just by looking at this figure, we cannot find where is the elastic limit. Even proportional limit is not something that we can identify just from the figure. One, because this figure, is, the accuracy of the data that we obtain from this is not so high that we can say that it is linear up to this point or not. And uh, second, that even if it were, then the variation would be so small that again, you would not be able to identify from this plot. So because of these reasons, what we have is only one point, which is the yield stress. So that is something you can physically obtain just from the data given to you. Next, uh, what we want to look at is, uh, when we talk about tensile characteristics, then there are two different types of stresses that are calculated. One is the true stress and the other is the engineering stress. Similarly for strain, we have true strain and engineering strain. And therefore we need to understand what is the difference between these two. And let me just correct this part. Yeah, so now it is true stress strain versus engineering stress strain. So we need to understand what is true stress strain and engineering stress strain. To begin with, again, you may have seen the plot for true stress strain versus the engineering stress strain. And this is how it will look like. So schematic, I'm drawing a schematic. Now on the x-axis, we have strain. It can be engineering, which is usually given by E, and the true strain, which is given by epsilon. On the y-axis, we have stress. The engineering is given usually by S, and the true is given by sigma. Now here, which one is engineering stress strain and which one is true stress strain? So most of you will identify that 
this one is the engineering stress strain because engineering stress eventually comes down. So this is And this is true stress strain. The, its characteristic is that it will never come down. It is always increasing. Now, this is the curve that is usually obtained uh, or plotted when we are doing any tensile test. And uh, that is because it is very easy to obtain or because we have all the data to translate from load versus elongation to engineering stress versus engineering strain. On the other hand, for true stress, true strain, we can only draw up to the UTS point. And beyond that, we need to get data from the sample like the neck radius, et cetera, to be able to draw the rest of the region. Uh, we'll talk about each of these one by one. But first let's look at the engineering stress strain curve. Now we know that when you are uh, deforming a material or basically stress strain is also deformation. So when you are deforming the material, in tensile, material should become harder, right? So this much is clear. Then the question is, if the material is becoming harder, meaning you need to apply higher stress, then why does the engineering stress strain come down? On the other hand, you can clearly see that true stress strain is continuously increasing and it does represent the true behavior in the sense that when the stress, when you are deforming and the material is becoming harder and the stress keeps on increasing. So this behavior, the true behavior is represented by Now let's uh, look at the two engineering, the curves, the engineering stress strain and the true stress strain curve uh, indiv individually. So here, stress is given by F by A naught and strain is given by L by L naught. Now you see that what is A naught? It is the initial area at the beginning of the test. Similarly, L naught is what? It is the initial load at the begin, uh, sorry, initial length at the very beginning of the test. Now, when you keep doing the deformation, this quantity and this quantity is not changing. They are constant. So in effect, S versus E depicts nothing but, but force versus elongation. Okay, so initially, so in this particular curve, there are, there is competition taking place between two different things. One is here also basically stress uh, work hardening is taking place. And at the same time, the cross-sectional area is decreasing, but that is not been taken into account over here. And therefore the load itself starts to drop. Okay, so the load itself starts to drop and ideally the A naught would have, have also dropped. It's sorry, not the A naught, but the instantaneous area would also drop. And that would have reflected the true stress of increasing value. But since we have kept the initial area, which is constant and a larger value. Therefore, the stress, the engineering, the depicted by engineering stress, that also falls down. So there is competition between two different things. 
one is the increase in load due to strain hardening and decrease due to decreasing area. Okay. Now, until the point, so let's call this our UTS point as P up to this UTS point P, this increase in the load due to strain hardening is greater than decrease. So there is slight decrease in the area. If you remember from our, so let me again draw the dog bone here just for representation. So this is point C somewhere over here. This is point B somewhere over here. And this is point A somewhere over here. Actually C should be close to point P. So clearly what you see is that A to B, there is a slight decrease in the area cross-sectional area as you keep increasing the length because of the change in the length, there will be decrease in the diameter and therefore there will be decrease in the cross-sectional area. But what happens at C is that the cross-sectional area has now suddenly changed drastically because of the formation of the neck. It's no more gradual change. There is a sudden change or unevenness that has taken place in the gauge length which has led to a drop in the cross-sectional area at one particular region. And now this becomes the region where all the deformation will take place. So up to this point, before that necking takes place, increase in the load due to strain hardening is greater than decrease in load due to decrease in area. But things change drastically after UTS, which is point P. As you can see that the cross-sectional area has decreased drastically. Therefore, strain hardening is still taking place, but in a very small diameter, that neck region. is less than decrease in load or basically decrease in load is greater than due to decrease in area. So in the engineering stress train, this decrease has is now dominating after the UTS and therefore the load comes to starts coming down. And this is why you see a curve like this. And eventually this, this is a very, very small cross-sectional area over where you are applying the load and which gets saturated with the uh, strain and eventually fails. On the other hand, when we are talking about the true stress uh, strain curve,
the true stress strain curve dip, uh, depicts up to the UTS it is depicting for the whole gauge length because the deformation is taking place in that whole volume. So coming back to this diagram, so up to, if you look at A and B and a C, up to A, B and just before C. C is actually some, uh, to be more accurate, it is somewhere which is beyond P, just beyond point P. So up to A and B, all the deformation is taking place in all of the gauge length. So this whole volume is getting deformed. But point P onwards, or if that what is happening in sample C, the deformation is taking place in only this, this much region. So for true stress strain up to UTS, the, it is depicting for the whole gauge length. And after UTS, it is depicting only for the gauge length, unlike the uh, engineering stress strain. So here the area has also changed. The, the area it is taking into consideration is that a small area. And therefore, the stress value comes out to be higher, which is actually depicting the stress of only the neck region. And, and which we expect that it is strain hardening and therefore it should be higher. And that is what you see. So it keeps increasing. Okay, so now that clearly explains that why the engineering stress strain will drop while that true stress strain will keep on increasing. Now, another point uh, that we need to understand here is that we have uh, a relation between, or we can establish a relation between engineering strain to true strain. And similarly, we can establish a relation between true stress to engineering stress. So we will not get into the details of it. It is very simple and you can refer to the book for that. We will just show you the equation. So the equation is given over here. So sigma is the true stress and uh, S is the engineering stress. So it is given by related to each other by one plus E where E is the engineering strain. And epsilon is equal to Epsilon, which is the true strain, is related to the engineering strain by epsilon equal to ln 1 plus e. Now let's look at this data. This has been obtained by Professor Sudhansu Sekhar Singh in his lab for aluminum 7075. So what are some of the observations over here? So they obtained, obviously they obtained only the load versus elongation data, and then they translated it into engineering stress strain curve, which would be this one. And then also translated it into true stress strain curve, which is this one. So looking at this uh, data, what are some of the observations that we can make? The first observation that we can make is that the overall elastic part is so much smaller. And this is not even failure. This is actually the UTS point. We will uh, tell you why we are not including data beyond this, which will come in our next few slides. Now here, what we see is that the elastic region is much, much smaller than the plastic region. I shouldn't call region because it's not a, not a physical space. So I will say the elastic part of the plot. Another aspect uh, that you would note is that for very small strains, particularly this elastic regime, you can see red and blue curves are almost overlapping, which means for very small strains, the true strain and engineering strain are same.
is approximately equal to true. And similarly, if you look at the stress values, so for all practical purposes, the stresses are also same in the elastic regime. in the elastic regime. Another point to note is that if you go by this equation, then you would note that the true stress, the true stress is always higher than engineering stress. And the other aspect is that engineering strain is always greater than true strain. The implication of this is that you would always see the curve that equivalent points would always be like this. So it will always be the in true stress strain curve would always be like to the top left, top and left of the engineering stress strain curve. So that is the uh, outcome of the relation that we have given over here. And like we said that it is very easy to obtain and not very difficult to derive this equation. Okay, now that we have a good understanding of the engineering stress strain and true stress strain, we are in a position to solve a problem. But again, uh, before we go there, we, I mentioned one thing, which let me uh, explain that. So we said that this uh, true stress strain curve is shown only up to the point of UTS. So this is the point, which is our UTS over here. And the equivalent of UTS is this point. Now beyond this point, what is, so up to this point, what happens is that the overall length is increasing in a very structured way. So we were able to get true strain directly from the engineering strain. But now beyond this point, as you would uh, remember from our figure over here, there is a neck that has formed. Now what happens because of this neck, we don't know the dimension just by the engineering strain values you would actually have to measure the size of the neck to be able to detect or predict what is the actual diameter at this region to say, okay, this is what the strain is. That is one complication. Second is, if you look closely, what you will realize is that this is no more at this particular neck region. It is no more a uniaxial stress condition. It is actually a triaxial condition. And therefore you need to make uh, corrections for that too. And Therefore, beyond this point, it becomes a lot more difficult to obtain the data for true stress strain curve. And that is why most of the time what we draw is the engineering stress strain curve. Okay, so with that, now let's uh, move on to solve one example. It is given that a tensile sample of 0.5 centimeter diameter and two centimeter gauge length is subjected to a load of 10 kilonewton. So the D naught is equal to 0.5 centimeter and L naught is equal to 2 centimeter and F is equal to 10 kilonewton. Now it is also given that at this particular instant L, let's call it L1 is equal to 2.5 centimeter. So from here, we have L0 and L1. So we can clearly calculate first the engineering strain, which is L1 minus L0 by L0 equal to 0.5 by 2 equal to 0.25.
And since we have the engineering strain, so we can also calculate the true strain, which is equal to ln one plus E is equal to 0.223. And uh, for the engineering stress, we know it is equal to F by A. We know F, which is equal to 10,000 Newton and area is something which is A naught actually. So area is something we can calculate given that D naught. So area is equal to pi D naught square by four. And this comes out to 0.2 centimeter square. Therefore, stress comes out to 500 megapascal. And if we know S, then again, we can calculate the true stress, which is equal to S, 1 plus E, which will be equal to 625 mega Pascal. So we have uh, calculated true stress, we have calculated true strain. Now we need to calculate determined diameter at that point. Okay, so we know the initial diameter. Now what we have to find is the diameter at the other point. So for this, we can assume that uh, the volume remains constant. So we'll start with this uh, assumption and therefore L naught A naught is equal to L1 A1. Uh, and uh, we have used the notation D one square by four into L naught equal to pi, this is a D naught, D one square by four into L1. So this is gone. And what we have is D1 equal to L0 by L1 times D0. And this is 2 by 2.5 into 0 0.5. So this comes out to 0 0.447 centimeter. So we now we also know the diameter at this instant, but then this is assuming uniform deformation, which is already given to you. If it were not uniform deformation, meaning if it were beyond the UTS, then we cannot apply this uh, equation. Then we cannot apply any of these equation. Okay, so we have determined this. Now, since we have started with the assumption that the volume remains constant, so we can clearly say that nu is equal to 0.5. And therefore, this is also done. So we have uh, calculated a shown an example. And uh, here it was given the diameter and the initial length and the load. So from there, we use the equation to calculate the true stress or translate it into true stress and true strain values. Okay. So now we will uh, move on to some more tensile test parameters that can be obtained for the tensile test. So first thing is uh, we talked about the fact that tensile test that we conduct cannot give you the true stress value beyond the UTS. So there are some corrections, which is called, one of them is called Bridgman correction. So we'll look at that and see how it can be applied when we uh, beyond this UTS point. So what is Bridgman correction? Okay, so let's say we are using a circular dog bone. Okay, so So let's say we are looking at within the gauge length. So this is part of the dog bone and over here it will go somewhere like this. And this is the neck that has formed. 
or necking has taken place and this is a and let's say that we can fit a uh, radius r in the neck region so the r is defined as that now the bridgeman correction is given by a plot which is like this a by r and on the y axis we have sigma bar by sigma and over here a by r is 0, 0.0 and onwards so let's draw it up to 1.5 0 means 0 means a0 which means that sorry not uh, not that a0 but a by r is 0 which means r is infinite meaning no necking has taken place so this is the point of no necking So at this point, this and here sigma is the measured stress, meaning the stress that or the resistance being applied by the material. And sigma bar is the effective stress that is being applied in this region. So if you had no necking actually taking place, then sigma bar will be equal to sigma and therefore the curve starts from over here. And as the necking starts, then actually this value drops. And it asymptotically keeps reducing. And this is how it looks like. So the overall equation that we obtain looks something like this. So this is the form of the equation that from which this has been plotted. And uh, as you can see that as the necking keeps increasing, the sigma, well, sigma bar, the effective stress that is acting on this region is going lower and lower. So this way you would be able to calculate the true stress that is acting over there. And uh, based on this area, you would also calculate the true stress. So you will have that true stress plus this correction, which would give you a lower value than what would have been obtained earlier. So if you look back at our previous uh, example, so in here, if you apply the correction, Bridgman correction, then you would, the data you would get would be a little lower than this, meaning it would be somewhere like this. So this is the uh, Bridgman correction. So the next parameter that we will look at is the about the yielding and strength. We have already given you a preview that uh, yielding is a theoretical value and it is not possible to get the exact value and therefore what we have is a proof stress so we define 0.2 percent strain and at that particular 0.2 percent strain we calculate the yield strength so let's look at it how it is practically done so this is how your plot would look like on the x-axis you have stress and on the y-axis you have strain. And as, as you remember that for the very small values of strain, the true stress and true engineering stress would not vary much. In fact, even the engineering stress and true st uh, strain would not vary much. So we need not worry about whether it is true or engineering. Now over here, we can 
if you let's say that at any particular point you reverse the load or remove the load what happens is that the material will show some plastic strain and the elastic part of the strain would recover so it will follow a path something like this now the path for which you get a remnant strain of 0 0.002 which is equal to 0.2 percent that particular stress is what is termed as yield strength so this is a value which uh, tells you where the yielding begins and uh, for a structural application you want to stay away from the yield strength you would want to design a material or a component so that you your material never reaches anywhere close to yield strength and you will put a safety factor probably two or three so that the overall load is such that the stresses are below, so much below the yield strength there is uh, still another uh, way or another parameter which is used for defining the strength of a material. So yield strength is one uh, way to define the strength of a material. Another one is the UTS. So we have looked at the UTS several times so far. Now let's look at it from application point of view. So this is how a stress strain curve would look like, the engineering stress strain. And somewhere over here is your yield strength, sorry, the uh, UTS, the point where you have the maximum load. Okay, so remember the shape of the curve would be same for force versus elongation as it would be for engineering stress versus engineering strain. Because in both the, when you translate from force versus elongation, you are only dividing it by a constant factor, A naught on for the Y axis and L naught for the X axis. So the shape is same and therefore this point also reflects the point of maximum load. Which is, all, which is called as ultimate tensile strength or UTS. Yield strength, we said, is more useful from the point of view of application in a structural application. On the other hand, UTS is more important from the point of view of uh, forming of materials. When you are trying to deform a material for making some particular shape of, out of the component, so you are basically performing a forming operation. Now, in that forming operation, you want to know what is the maximum amount of stress that would be required for deforming the material. And this would come from this UTS. So this is why it is also called the ultimate tensile strength, meaning that is the maximum tension that you can, or the stress, tensile stress that can be borne by this material. And uh, it has, like I said, it has a uh, particular significance from the point of view of forming operations. So you would want to design your devices or equipment for forming so that it is able to apply at least this much of uh, stress or probably you will apply also apply a shift safety factor so that there is uh, 40, 20 to 30% higher stresses to ensure that there is proper deformation of the material. In fact, we use a different term as we'll see in one of the later lectures, flow stress. So the material actually starts to flow. You can keep deforming the material and it will keep flowing. So we will define that term, which is not really the UTS, but, and not even the uh, yield strength, but something which keeps on changing from UTS to, keeps changing from yield strength to UTS. So that is uh, the 
parameter about yielding and strength. And uh, we have already seen how to measure yield strength for measuring the UTS. All you need to find out is the strain at which you get the maximum load and then corresponding to that strain, you will calculate the stress. So that would be your UTS in engineering or you can equivalently calculate the true stress at that point. So that uh, so UTS can be calculated either as a true stress or as a engineering stress, depending upon the application. Next parameter that we are going to discuss is the elastic modulus. So we, uh, we have already seen the origin of the elastic modulus. And in the, today, in this part, we will look at how to calculate the elastic modulus from the stress strain data. But to warn you that the data that you obtain from stress strain is not very accurate for measuring elastic modulus. And it is rarely done. And rarely you use the stress strain data to calculate the elastic modulus of a material. But nevertheless, since you have data, you can uh, use it to obtain elastic modulus. So again, let's see. So let's say you have the, so I'm intentionally drawing it a little larger slope. Why? Because uh, I'm assuming that the X axis is a little bit expanded. And uh, therefore, we can see clearly the slope that we want to measure over here. So here we have on the x-axis, we have stress. And on the x, y-axis, we have strain. So ideally, this is what your, the slope of this line is what should be termed as the elastic modulus. But then, we know that this can hardly be the case that you will get such a straight line. So there are two methods that are available. Either you can drop the load and then calculate the slope for this line. So this will be your elastic modulus. Or you can take a tangent at a particular point. So since it is continuously changing, so you can take a tangent at any particular point. So let's say somewhere close to the value, close to the zero, zero value, but where you have depend reliability of the data, you can take a tangent of the data and this tangent would give you the elastic modulus. So overall, you have two different techniques. One is the second method. So you are connecting two different points. And the other is the tangent method. So this will give you the elastic modulus. Next, let's look at another parameter, which is strain and ductility. So we have already looked at strain at great, great length. But now we will also look at some more parameters related to strain. For example, there is uniform, uniform strain. There is strain up to fracture. These are two other parameters. Then there is plastic strain. There is elastic strain. So again, let me... So let's say we are at the point UTS. So if we drop the load, then it will come down and it will follow the slope almost that you have in the beginning. So it will be like this. And if you drop a straight line from over here, so it went all the way of a strain up to this point. But this part 
was recovered and therefore this can be called as elastic strain. This part of the strain is not recovered and this remains permanent and therefore this can be called as plastic strain. So that is uh, some of the other parameters related to strain. Another few parameters related to strain are, we already know that we get So the strain that we get up to this point, this is called uniform elongation, strain at uniform elongation. This will be the maximum uniform elongation that you can get. So it is, or you can call it simply strain at UTS or strain at maximum uniform elongation. And likewise, you will also have a strain at fracture. And this uh, total strain, which is the strain at fracture, determines the ductility of the material. But in uh, practical application, if you look at it, it is the strain at uniform, the maximum uniform elongation that you get is what is the, the is the strain that is actually of any meaning to us because beyond that the all the deformation is taking place is only localized and uh, it cannot be utilized or it cannot be made any use of and uh, therefore the strain which if you want if you're working on improving the strength and ductility of a material what we want to increase is the total uniform elongation so yes, so that was the term I was looking for. This is the total uniform elongation. So from the point of view of uh, ductility, this is a important parameter. So moving on to one more important parameter related to stress strain. This is resilience and toughness. Again, to describe it, let me first draw the stress strain curve. So again, I have drawn a much gentler slope than you, what you would observe, because again, we want to be able to describe what is resilience. So, and this is smooth here. It may look like So this is somewhere over here, you have the yield point. So if you take the total energy that the material can absorb in the elastic region, that is called resilience. Area under elastic deformation. On the other hand, let's say that the material eventually fails. So there would be a total area that we can obtain at strain fracture. So this area, which is under the overall stress strain curve, this is called toughness area under the entire curve.
this is this is resilience and this is toughness so this is related to this elastic behavior of the material and this is related to the plastic deformation primarily to the plastic deformation of the material so it is representing how much energy the material will or this component will absorb before failing and here it is showing how much energy it will absorb before transforming to the plastic state so it remains in the elastic state but if it goes to the plastic state how much energy will it uh, absorb so with that in mind let's say if you are given two different materials so let's say one material has a stress strain curve like this while the other one and interestingly you can get both type of behavior in the steel itself so clearly what we see is that this one will have higher resilience meaning the overall region area that you would get in the elastic regime for this red curve would be higher so this one will show higher resilience but lower toughness because the total area under this curve would be much smaller than in the green one on the other hand this one will show higher toughness but lower resilience so this one is an example of medium carbon steel while this one is structural steel or high carbon steel so th this is sorry this is not the structural steel actually the medium carbon steel will be the structural steel and uh, if you were to apply one of these for uh, ball bearing and the other for bumper in the car then which one do you think would be more suitable so as you can imagine ball bearing it does you don't want it to deform so it want you want it to remain in the elastic regime and therefore it, you want it to be able to absorb more energy before it transforms into plastic state therefore this is the one which would be more suitable for ball bearing so yes high carbon steel is used for ball bearing on the other hand this is the one that you would actually use for application in uh, bumpers for automobile so you want the steel which would be in the bumper to be able to absorb a lot of energy before it fails so it has to get plastically deformed that is the purpose of the bumper but then before it fails you want it to be able to absorb maximum amount of energy and therefore this type of steel would be useful for bumper in automobile so interestingly both of them are steel but depending upon their different microstructure you can get different kind of application out of them so these are the important uh, characteristics that are related to tensile test and it tensile test we started with tensile test because it very nicely shows the transition from elastic to the plastic regime and uh, also the tensile test characterization gives you loads of data which we have looked at over here and uh, we also got introduced with the concept of true stress engineering stress and so on so with that we will end this chapter and we'll come back but 
uh, we still have few more things to talk about uh, tensile test, particularly from the point of view of the instrument that is used for testing the tensile characteristics. So we'll end this uh, section. I will end this topic for now. Thank you.